to lecture 10 of the course and today we are uh, devoted to merging ideas that we develop at the beginning of the course and in the middle of the course and namely we are try to uh, look at stochastic dynamics dynamics through the eyes of renormalization group so if you want the title of this uh, of this talk is renormalizing stochastic dynamics or Langevin dynamics to be more specific so let me um, let me let me review in a in a sort of a short short way what do I mean by renormalize the stochastic dynamics uh, our goal is to consider a low energy low resolution uh, description of the dynamics which at a microscopic level is described through the Langevin equation so in other words we think of a system represented by uh, a Langevin equation and let's again be specifically concentrating on the overdamp limits because it contains all of the uh, issues of the underdamp limit in terms of mathematical formulation is just slightly simpler because it doesn't involve phase space but only configuration space we have a system described by Langevin equation and uh, we have an associated Fokker Planck equation And the Fokker Planck equation has a spectrum of uh, frequencies. And let me draw the spectrum of frequencies. Now, in particular, we are interested in physical systems in which the underlying energy surface, which I here draw in in 1D for simplicity, that's U of X, and that's the configuration X. We are interested in physical systems where uh, the underlying energy surface is actually um, rugged. What do we mean by rugged? We mean physical system in which we have an exponentially large number of basins and barriers and somehow these two these features should combine in such a way that diffusion on this energy landscape is is a slow process um, we're also interested in systems with a very very large dimensionality uh, because again we're interested in complex systems so it turns out that complex systems typically are uh, displaying these two features very large dimensionality large number of particles and rugged energy landscape rugged, rugged energy landscape is typically is a feature of a physical phenomena called frustration so what is a frustration well you know in life one is frustrated anytime no matter its effort is effort or her effort it cannot achieve a goal, right? I mean, that's frustrating when you try hard and you get nowhere. I don't completely fulfill the goal that you want. And in, in complex systems, you get frustration anytime you can never really optimize uh, the energy of the system without uh, exciting the energy of the system at the same time. For instance, you have a system of hard walls, a very dense system of hard walls, now, as long if the density of the system is low enough, then of course you have a. You suppose you start from a configuration with a, a little bit of overlap between the between the walls, the balls, and then you relax the energy and you go to a system configuration with zero energy. Uh, that's my wife, by the way, uh, coming up from background. 
<laughs> she couldn't she couldn't help it so we are, we are going really down guys I mean it's <laughs> psychological stability is really an issue after three weeks so okay but any, anyway I was trying to tell about okay go move okay fine frustration uh, is a is a is a phenomenon that occurs when any time you try to so get rid of some energy clash, you enter another energy clash on the other side. Think about a system of hard balls near jamming configuration. A jamming configuration is really when each ball touches all others. Now, if you are a jamming, clearly you are maximally frustrated because you try to minimize a small overlap here and you make an angry one here, then you move here and you make an angry another ball that sits down here. Now, typically complex systems have a frustrated energy landscape, and the prototype of that is actually uh, glasses. Glasses are, by default, systems with a large, exponentially large number of nearly degenerate energy minima separated by barriers. And navigation in this energy landscape is extremely slow. And that's precisely the reason why glass window they basically remain in their vertical shape, even that, even though with geologically long time they should sort of spread out, and since they are fluid after all. But but but, the, but each of these transitions takes an enormous amount of time, and you actually never see that, right? The the ground state, the real ground state of silica, normally glasses are made of silica. That's a that's a crystal, and glasses are not a crystal, but a relaxation to thermal equilibrium is so long that basically it never happens, on, if not on geological scale. And I'm not even aware that can happen on that scale. This is something I leave for the experts of, of glasses. Okay, so but we are interested in a, in, a, in a system, in a complex system with a corrugated or rugged energy landscape. And if you have a rugged energy landscape, we discovered in the previous lectures that uh, anytime you have a barrier, you have a decoupling of time scales associated with local relaxation within the basins and global relaxation across the barrier. So we have a gap in the spectrum of the focal Planck operator. Now, in principle, you can have a system with uh, corrugations at different scales. So, for instance, you have a very short, then you have a number of medium sized barriers, maybe you have a very large barriers. Now, it's clear that if, if this is the system and say a temperature, thermal energy is something like this, then clearly you have a re very fast relaxation and basically throughout some regions. You have a moderate relaxation throughout other regions, and then you have some really uh, relaxation limiting processes, which is in this case this barrier, or these barriers as well. So if I look at the corresponding spectrum of the focal Planck operator, I will have a zero mode because, in principle, there is a Boltzmann distribution, whether you attain it in a geological time, that's a different discussion. But in principle, you have a, a zero mode. Then you have a bunch of modes here. Then you have a, a gap, and maybe a bunch of modes here, and then another gap, and a bunch of modes here. And at each gap, there corresponds uh, a different type of process, different time scales, as, uh, time scales for, for local, medium size, and global relaxation through the process. In principle, solving Langevin equation for a sufficiently long time will get will give you a complete descriptions of all this, and and you will get all these dynamics in place, uh, up to a maximum frequency, which is of the order of two pi over delta t. That's the discretization time. That's our hardest UV cutoff in our theory because we have an overdamp Langevin equation. Delta t must be greater than the under than the damping time scales beyond which the acceleration 
is neglected. And so above there, above this UV cutoff scale, there is the underdumped regime, and much above, maybe you enter the quantum regime, or who knows. But we are building a theory with our cutoff, lambda cutoff, the, short, the highest possible cutoff to be legitimately allowed to use the Langevin equation is 2 pi over the delta t we adopted in integrating out the Langevin equation. Below that cutoff, everything we do is okay. We, in principle, have all the physics there to resolve all these time scales or frequency scales that come here. But then we want to do something more. We want to say, oh, I see gaps, and any time I see gaps from lecture 1, 2, and 3 in this course, we know renormalization group can come at play to devise rigorous effective theories for the low energy dynamics, which basically have the advantage of providing a simplified description at the price of having to incorporate the details of the ultraviolet physics into a finite number of effective parameters of the effective theory. And we uh, spent a long time in thinking this is a, a rigorous way of proceeding modeling for the infrared physics anytime we have a cutoff. So the question we want to ask is, suppose we are not interested in all the dynamics that is encoded in the Langevin equation, but we are only interested in processes that take long time, in the long time dynamics. Now, for sake of simplicity, let's consider first the case in which you have only two, two sets of scales, fast scales and slow scales. So that's slow processes and fast processes. It is quite and of course, then you have the ultraviolet physics, we are not interested. And suppose the lambda cutoff is above here. Uh, you can easily adapt the same discussion when you have more than one gap. You just do things stepwise. You know, you go from first uh, to second, and then you know, progressively lower, getting more and more effective theories out of the same basically physical construction. But for the sake of this lecture, let's remain in the case in which you have fast versus slow process. Now, suppose we are only interested in the long time dynamics of the system, and we are not interested in the very fast dynamics. And to be specific, in this case, suppose we have a rugged energy landscape with some maybe fast relaxation. We have a, some limiting, maybe a couple. In this case, it's just one, but you can be more general. We have a few barriers over the same size. And we are not only interested in the dynamics that concern hoping between these basins, which are the slow processes, but we are not interested in the fast dynamics that concern hoping within these very, very shallow basins. So we are not interested in the fast navigation within each of these basins, but we are interested in the slow hoping between the bases. Well, that's, again, a situation very similar to the multiple expansion of electrostatic we refer to. Suppose we are not interested in the, char in, the, in the electric field very close to the charge distribution, but only the electric field at very large distances from the charge source, from the field source, so that we can sort of integrate all the fine details about the charge distribution into the monopole, quad dipole, quadrupole, uh, effective uh, constants and so on and so forth. Then we would like to work out an effective description for the Langevin equation. That's our goal. Now, in order to do that, um, it is quite surprising that a question as fundamental as this, because after all the Langevin equation has been around for more than a century, it is quite interesting to notice that the mathematical foundation for addressing this specific question has only come out very recently, maybe some 20 years ago up to now. I was already uh, through my PhD, perhaps, when these results came out, and I find it quite surprising 
given the simplicity of the question and the fact that it relates to rather fundamental questions. So I will quote some mathematician's result, and you can find reference in the notes, without giving the demonstration. I am sure that there is a proof that physicists can digest better. Uh, but the problem with these uh, theorems is that they belong to the mathematician's literature. I had a hard time digesting even the statements, and in providing the proof here uh, would be perhaps uh, uh, far too technical. And maybe with time people will come up with a simpler proof, maybe less formal, less uh, rigorous, that can be delivered in lectures. This time has not come yet. So, I will quote a theorem, if you want, it contains several statements, and this theorem provides the foundation of what is called Markov state models, or modeling. Okay, so what does this theorem say? It says, any time the spectrum of the Fokker-Planck operator contains a gap and let n be the lowest n eigenvalues of uh, in the spectrum, the lowest, the very lowest being of course the zero mode zero. Well, of course, in general, the Fokker Planck operators has infinitely many eigenvalues because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a if the potential uh, you know is, is bounded uh, from below general have infinitely many eigenvalues, the space is infinitely dimensional. Uh, but we are not interested in the full spectrum, we, are, we know that there is a gap, and we know that there are n eigenvalues below this gap. Then whenever this happens, you can take the corresponding right eigenstates of the Fokker-Planck operator, and with this eigenstates of focal planck operator, you can construct exactly m functions, pi, out of linear combinations of the n right eigenstates below the gap. And this function, of course, this is not a statement, this is just a, of course, you can always take your n functions and linearly combine them. There, there is no statement. The statement comes now. You can find n eigenstate below the gap such that the PIs obey the following property. Number one, they are positive definite. Number two, they are nearly disjoint what do I mean? What do I mean by nearly zero? It means there is a number that is exponentially suppressed as the temperature de decreases. So basically when I say zero, is zero in the infinitely small temperature limit, but exponentially small at final temperature. And third, locally Gibson. What do I mean by locally Gibson? I mean that I can approximate Pi as in the following way. So what is written here, e beta e to the negative beta u is the Boltzmann distribution. Zeta i is the partition function, and I will tell you what. H i is a function that is close to one in a region, in a finite region, where uh, near the local maximum of this probability, and is zero otherwise. So Basically, this is a function, and you find a picture in my notes, that selects out a basing in the potential energy landscape. Zeta i 
is the partition function restricted to this basis. So it's basically e to the minus beta u h i of x. I cannot be right here, so let me write it here. So, what is this theorem telling me? Uh, if you go over the statements slowly and try to think about it, you you know you give yourself some time to reason about that. Basically, what these three statements tell you is that any time I have a gap in the spectrum and I have a energy landscape, I can you know. Typically, I have as many as low modes as as many slow processes in the system. So typically, if all these are comparable in height, I will have, I don't know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 7 lowest eigenvalues, or 6. There's always this n minus 1 issue I never can keep track of. Uh, then I, cannot, I can use the lowest right eigenstates to construct some probability that basically look like Boltzmann within each of these bases. So I'm saying that with out of the lowest n eigenvalues I can always construct some object that looks like probability distribution there that describes the local equilibrium within each of the bases. That's P1, P2, P3, and each of these P corresponds to a different linear combination of the R. This is the index spanning the different linear combination. Well, this is the way the mathematicians like to think about it. They have a general problem, they have uh, properties of your system, and then they can come out with uh, a mathematical result. Physicists like to think about it in the reverse order, because that makes a lot of sense in terms of physical intuition. Because since you have this relationship here, you can actually invert it and discover that the lowest and eigenvalues can be constructed as a linear combination of Gibbsian distributions. So, really, this is what the physics is trying to tell us through this mathematical theorem. The physics is if I'm interested in, if I have a complex system with slow and fast process. If I look at the slow process, meaning the n eigenvalues are uh, below, below the gap, all the fast equilibration has already occurred. So within each of these basin, I have already attained the Boltzmann distribution locally. So any properties of the dynamics, all the spectrum and all the eigenvalues, eigenstates of the focke planck operator, is actually written to very good approximation as a linear combination of positive and negative uh, Boltzmann function, functions, locally Boltzmann fun, uh, functions, distributions. So basically, this is simply tell you, below the gap, everything within each basin has thermalized to a Boltzmann distribution, and, and the right eigenvalues must be linear combination of this. For those of you who have a background in, uh, in condensed matter theory, this is essentially what you do when you do a tight binding model for electrostatics. Instead of solving the Coulomb's Hamiltonian for all electrons, you imagine that the electrons sit in the ground state of an atom in a lattice, and you're only interested in the diagonalization in the space of the ground states in which the electron sits in each of the atoms of the system. Now we're doing the same. We're diagonalizing the focke planck operator, but not in the coordinate basis, but in the basis in which each particle sits in a thermal distribution locally within each basin. So I have n independent thermal distributions, out of which I build the lowest n eigenvalues, and sorry, eigenvector on my focke planck 
operator. Well, that's a quite a strong statement, right? Now, having this strong statement is extremely useful. Uh, it is also convenient, before we, we move any further, to, to look at the spectral decomposition in the presence of a gap. Well, clearly, my Fokker-Planck propagator in the presence of a gap looks like the following. This is always true, but now if I have a gap, as soon as n is greater than 1 over lambda uv minus lambda soft, where lambda uv is a typical value of eigenvalues in above the gap, and lambda soft is a typical value of, of the eigenvalue below the gap. As soon as the time is longer than this, then clearly all the contributions from the states above the gap in this summation are exponentially suppressed, and I don't need to account for that. So basically, what this result is telling me that I can use only n eigenvector eigenfunctions of the Fokker-Planck operator uh, to reproduce all the probability all the of the dynamics encoded in the correlator. And in the previous lecture, we already made use of this. Remember, we were interested in the double well problem. Now, in the double well problem, there's only one barrier, and there's therefore only two soft eigenstates. One is the trivial one, the Boltzmann distribution, and the other one is the less to trivial. And, and then all others are fast scales, because they all concern the thermalization within the basis. And in fact, if you look at the numerical solutions that we worked out, we notice that the ground state solution, the Boltzmann solution, was actually a, basically a sum of Boltzmann. And the first excited state was an anti-symmetric sum of Boltzmann, in complete agreement with what we just said now. Both the, the two eigenmodes below the gap are written as uh, two, in two different linear combinations of the Boltzmann distribution, or locally Boltzmann distribution. And in addition, when we computed the quantum propagator, sorry, the Fokker-Planck propagator, we were actually simply summing the Boltzmann plus the correction. and completely neglecting all others because they were about the gap. And that's how we got this probability distribution after a time, a specific time that looked like this. Remember, I'll go back in previous notes, notes uh, previous lecture, and you see that. OK, so with these results in mind, the next question is, can we, can we represent, once we understand that the dynamics within each basin is Boltzmann, and it's therefore given, then it really is redundant to describe the systems in terms of position eigenstates. Because after all, we know that there's nothing interesting within each basin. This is just a Boltzmann distribution. We want to discuss the system, the dynamics, in a different way. We want the dynamics to be described as the probability to be in any of the bases of the system as a function of t. And then if I want a particular configuration within the basin, I will just thermally sample that using the Boltzmann distribution. So the idea is, first of all, to define the probability to find the system in the eth basin at time t. And that's very simple is the integral over all configuration space of the characteristic function of the eth basin times the Fokker-Planck probability times t. That's counting all the states that are in the 
ETH basis, ETH basis only. And then what we want to find is the time evolution of this uh, probability. Well, let's begin, but, you know, let's, let's go stepwise. Let's first do the simplest possible thing. Let's look at what is ni when t goes to infinity. Well, in the limit in which time goes to infinity of ni of t, well, then it's simple, and this is simply the Boltzmann distribution. And therefore, this is just a ratio between the partition function of uh, my ETH basin and the total partition function. In addition, since the probability density is locally Gibson, the total partition function is nothing but the sum of the, all the possible n partition functions, up to exponentially small correction. So it's basically the, rel the, the relative weight of my state compared to all others at equilibrium. But that's okay because we know that uh, you know that's that's nothing but a long time the system has thermalized globally. Okay, let's now look at the intermediate time. Okay, so let's to 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 solve for the dynamics in the transient time. Let's take the ni distribution and look at the infinitesimal time variation of it. Now. To do that, what we can do, we can exploit Markovianity. Whenever you have a Markovian, Markovian process, you have what is called a chapman kolmogorov relationship. What is a chapman kolmogorov relationship? It's the statement, you can write it this way, the probability to go from x to x naught to x can be always written as the probability to go from x to some intermediate point y in some intermediate time tau times the probability to go from tau to x in the remaining time. This is just a consequence of Markovianity because once you are in y, then you forget about your past. The probability of making it to the product is simply is given by this probability here, because the process is not coping. But of course, you have to marginalize over all the intermediate times. That's basically kind of a slit problem. The probability of making it from here to here is the probability to make it to any point in between at some intermediate time, and then well, you don't know, if you, if you apply the, the chapman kolmogorov relationship, then the density of state at time t plus delta t can be written in this form. Take my integral over dy of p x in time delta t from y times p to make it to y in time delta t. That's just a chapman kolmogorov relationship. Now, I use the fact that my p y t can be written as a sum from n going from 1 to n, the number of states below the gap, as r n y c n e to the minus lambda n t, where c n is nothing but the Fourier component, right? Left n x P and of course there's a there's a coefficient in between. Now the C N to be sorry, to be more specific, this CN is actually oh, let's let's do things more carefully, sorry. Let's suppose PYT is actually the propagator starting from
from some initial distribution, let's call it Z. Okay, then you can decompose this object spectrally, and this will be some of the right and Y, left and Z, e to the minus lambda and T rho of Z, then you get in my CNs, you get a sum over N, then you get the my I have my R N Y E to the negative lambda and T and my CNs are nothing but integral and D Z of L N Z times times rho of Z. Okay, that's a bit more uh, a bit more formal. As, a, as an expression. So there is a mistake in equation 3.159 then soon enough. Okay, so after you've done with that, the probability, you know, you, you work on it and you discover that uh, now you use the fact that uh, you can express the Rn states as a linear combination of the Pj states, the, the Gibson distribution. And you then remember that the Pj is a locally Gibson distribution. And you arrive to an expression which is the following sum over n. Uh, sum of n, where am I? Sum of j, c and j, h, j, y, e to the negative beta u, y, c n, e to the negative lambda n. Okay, let me erase this. Okay, I'm just using the mathematical theorem that I was referring to before. Nothing more, nothing less. Well, if you do that, then you can plug this back into the definition of the n i t plus delta t. And remember, on the right hand side of the backward Kolmogorov expression, sorry, the Chapman Kolmogorov expression, the Chapman Kolmogorov expression involved this probability. And here is the explicit expression for that probability. If you do that and you evaluate physically all the terms, you come up with this expression, which you can conveniently write in the following way. This is a quantity which I will need to define in a moment. And C and J, small n, e to the negative lambda n, and T. Where this matrix, T, I, J, delta T, is actually the probability distribution to start from any point in the jth state and land into any point of the i-th state after a time delta t. So this is the locally Gibson distribution. So what this expression says is, take any point here in the basins j. Its probability is sampled correctly by the Boltzmann distribution, local Boltzmann distribution Pj. And this is the transition probability in time t to a point x, which I restrict to be in the basis i. So this is really the probability that I make a transition from any point sampled in, in, from state j, assuming the state j is in local equilibrium, which is correct if I'm interested in the dynamics below the gap. And what is the probability to be in the i-th state after time t? 
So, what this expression is telling me, after all, is that uh, the evolution of the probability densities here is controlled by these transitions probability between the states, which is quite meaningful, right? I mean, it's quite expected. Now, what, I, what is left to be done is to understand what this term is all about. Well, it, it is quite natural to discover that this is basically nothing but precisely n of j. And in order to see that, one simply writes down n of j of t, well, remember his own definition, h j of x, p x t, and then performs the spectral decomposition of this guy in the same way as we have done. And this is sum over n, c of n, e to the negative lambda n t, c and j h, not h bar, j of x times e to the negative beta u of x over zj. Now, what happens is that you see this, this, and this, they all combine to form zj, which cancels with the gz that sits down here, and therefore it cancels, leaving out precisely the term that enters here. So, wrapping up, ni at t plus delta t is written as a sum over j of t i j delta t and j of t. So this is a discrete time master equation. And physically, it's exactly what you expect to find. The probability to find the system in uh, state uh, i at time t plus delta t is the probability to find a system in any other state, any state at time t, times the probability of performing a state from that state to the state i in a time delta t, summed over the possible States. So, in other words, the probability to be in the state i is evaluated by summing the transition into i coming from all other states n itself and subtracting the probability of going from a to other states, or taking into account the possibility that you can also go from i somewhere else. Now, it is, since delta t is a tunable parameter, it is sometimes convenient to extrapolate it and, you know, define an object. For small delta t, I can always expand this in, series there, in Taylor series, and I can write this guy. Now, this has a, this matrix has a, a dimension of a frequency, and it's called the rate matrix. Now, if you do, if you write this in terms of rate matrix, then you can basically, you know, if you tailor, if you differentiate with respect to delta t, the, mass, the continuous time mass square equation, and you use this equation, it's immediate to arrive to a new form of the master equation, which now is a differential form. And it's telling you basically the same information, but in terms of rate of flow out, the flow in the state. This is called the continuous time master equation. Now, It is important to realize that these T matrices and K matrix are not just any matrices, because their physical interpretations comes, their definition comes from integration of the Fokker-Planck uh, uh, propagator. But a Fokker-Planck propagator, by constructions, as we saw a couple of lectures ago, 
obeys the detailed balance conditions. Now, if you apply this, it is immediate to discover that the density matrices, the transition matrices, and the K matrices have spatial properties. And let's refer, for the sake of definiteness, to the, spec to the properties of the rate matrix. And by the Taylor expansion that defines the rate matrix, you can transfer this property onto the properties of the T matrix. But typically, remember, the tail balance is responsible for uh, achieving thermal equilibrium and ensuring conservation of number of particles, right? And if you translate this information at the level of a K matrix, what you discover is typically is that KII is the negative of the sum of KJI over J. So the diagonal elements are taken by summing all the terms of the column. So these terms here are equal to the negative of all the terms in the column, except the third terms. And the physical interpretation is clear. The rate of particles that stay in state i is the negative of the rate of particle that flow outside the state. Now, a, property, a matrix that has this property is called left stochastic. And a matrix that is left stochastic uh, by by construction has a real spectrum and a zero mode stationary distribution, which simply means you do converge to thermal equilibrium. But that's something you want to inherit from the detailed balance condition. OK, so we arrive to this level of uh, confidence, and we arrive to the level of discretizing the state to the right, uh, to, to, to a low energy description below the gap. And the result is a Markov state model in which the effective degrees of freedom are the states. And your dynamical variable is the population of the states rather than the focal plan probability. What about the effective parameters of this effective theory? They are the entries of the stochastic rate matrix or the transition matrix. So basically, these are the effective parameters that play the role of the multiple expansion parameters in the multiple expansion, in the electrostatic analogy. And they encode all the physics. The details of the physics were not resolved yet. And in fact, remember, you can always get the effective parameter either from the experiment or microscopic calculation. And the explicit expression of transition probability given in terms of Fokker-Planck distributions, those are the mapping between the microscopic dynamics and the effective parameters of the effective theory evaluated microscopically in the underlying ultraviolet, uh, more fundamental description. So you see, that's how renormalization group ideas get applied to stochastic process and enable you to get a lower resolution representation of the dynamics. In the next lectures, we'll try to see how can you actually use this understanding uh, to simplify real simulations, and basically we'll deal with the problem how to find the microstates and the rates. Um, let me anticipate that there's a famous scheme called folding at home, which was very, which has become very famous because it enables you to, you know, use the mathematical procedure to study extremely long molecular dynamics processes by exploiting. exploiting the lag time, the idle time of computers, uh, of an exponentially huge number of computers uh, that were distributed globally. But I'll talk about that in the next lecture, very briefly. Goodbye.